Hi, welcome to Grace Hill at Home. My name is Ryan, and this is my wife, Lauren, and we're the pastors at Grace Hill. And we want to say thank you for joining us this morning for our service. Our prayer for you is this, that this service will be a blessing in your life, it will be a blessing into the lives of your family, and it will be a blessing in your home during these different times that we're walking through. Hey, we've been praying for you this week, you and your family. We've been praying some specific things for you, praying that the peace of God would flood your home, praying that miracles would begin to happen, because what we know is that God has not forsaken us, He has not left us, but He is in this, and our greatest days are yet to come. Would you join with your family now as I pray, and we just begin the service together. Let's ask the presence of God to fill our homes right here, right now, as we seek His face, as we worship Him, and as we learn from His Word. Join me in prayer right now. Father God, we come before you, Lord Jesus, knowing that you are the Almighty God. Lord, we pray right now, Lord Jesus, that you would continue to fill our homes with peace and assurance of who you are, Lord God. That we would not walk in the uncertainty of these days, but we would walk in the certainty of who you are, Jesus. That you are in control. Fill our homes today, God, and may your peace surpass all of our understanding, God, as we lift your name, God, as we worship you today. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Hey, join us as we worship together this morning.
trust in you today. Lord, despite what the circumstances may say, Lord, we fix our eyes on you. We set our hearts and our minds on you who keeps us in perfect peace, Lord. We trust you this morning. We bless your name, Lord. Be glorified in Jesus' name. with us today. Something that we love to do at our church after worship is what we call intermission. So right now, we want to do that on a digital platform. Will you begin commenting right now on this video? I know you see some of your church family here, so why don't you say hello to one another? We want to start to see your comments just flooding in right now. A couple of announcements for you. Don't forget about Grace Kids at Home. This is a tailor-made service for your kids on our YouTube channel. You can find it by searching Grace Hill Dallas on YouTube or go to our website, click on watch, and you'll be able to find it there. Make sure you don't miss it. Your kids are gonna love it. Also, what we know more than ever is we need to continue having community with one another. And how we're gonna do that is by having our small groups. So if you're a part of one of our small groups or maybe you're here for the first time and you wanna join one, Go to our website on our homepage, click on join a group. You can find out when these groups are meeting. They're having watch parties. Our small group leaders are just stepping up to the plate. We want you to get involved. Make sure you do that today. We're gonna take our tithe and offering at this time. And I just wanna say thank you so much to so many of you that are continuing to be faithful in your giving. We're so grateful because we know that your giving is continuing to advance the kingdom. There are two ways you can give today. You can text any amount to 84321, or if you go to our website, click on the giving icon and then click on donate, you can see all the different things you can give to, as well as our coronavirus 
unemployment fund. So we just thank you in advance for that. Let's just pray and ask the Lord to bless this time. Lord, thank you so much for this moment, Lord, where we can give. It's just another act of worship to you, Lord Jesus. I pray that you would bless those that can, bless those that will. And Lord, may it be stretched and may it go farther than it ever has before, all for the sake of changed lives and your kingdom growing. Thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, welcome to Grace Hill at Home Week 2. We're just so excited that you're joining us again this week uh, from your home, there in your living room, or, or maybe around the kitchen table or your bedroom, or just wherever you're joining us from. Thank you so much for being with us today. If you could do us a favor, share this on your timeline so that others can hear the word. Our hope is with this new series that people will find Jesus, right? And that's our desire, that's our heart. We do what we do for the sake of changed lives, right? And, and one of the ways you can help us with that is just simply by sharing this video and letting it spread far and wide to all of those in your world and all of those around you. So thank you in advance for doing that. So we're starting a new series called The Wonderful Cross, and I can't think of a better thing to talk about right now than Jesus, and specifically the cross of Jesus, the cross that he was on, the cross that he bore, because there are several others who have died on a cross, but the fact that it was the cross that Jesus was on makes it so much more special, and that's why we're calling this the wonderful cross. And so our hope through this is that our affections for Jesus are stirred up, that our desire to know him more and to be so thankful and full of joy for the work that he did for us just begins to swell inside of us. And so let's pray as we jump into this today. Father, we love you. We thank you, God, for all of your goodness, for your grace and your mercy. And we pray, Lord, that through the word today, that lives will be changed, that hearts will be stirred towards you, and that people will come to know Jesus. And we thank you for it. We give you glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. So the, the main verse of these next two weeks is going to be found in Philippians. Again, the words of Paul. So Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 through 8. And let's jump in and let's read that together today. And it says, who being in very nature a God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death 
on a cross. So today we want to talk about that humility of Jesus. Have you ever uh, seen a home that just looks run down, it just looks to, to, to be in shambles, really to be in need of being torn down, right? You go, you drive, and you can find a lot of older homes where we live and in this part of Dallas, and you can see tons of old homes throughout. Some of them are beautiful, some of them have been well-maintained, and some have been restored back to their original beauty, and maybe even updated, and still have the character and the charm. And some people come and they see those homes, and they just tear them down, and they build a brand new. In fact, some neighbors of ours, not long ago, tore down a house and built a brand new house. And I'll tell you, it's a beautiful home. I think it's fantastic. I think it's wonderful. But there is something special about taking an older home and coming in and remodeling and restoring it and bringing new life into it. And all of a sudden, what was once old and run down and maybe didn't look good and, and people just kind of ignored or was an eyesore, all of a sudden is now beautiful. And, and the people in the neighborhood love it and they love the way it looks. It adds value to everything around it, right? I enjoy that. I love it. There's, and on our street, there's probably three or four houses right now being remodeled where people have come in, they're redoing the landscape and they're painting the exteriors fresh things up and all of a sudden our street just looks amazing right but it took someone to come into this old home that looked run down that looked like it had no life in it anymore to breathe life into it and to say you know what there is something great in this house if we just take a moment and build it back up and maybe you feel a little bit like that old house where you go, you know what, I've made poor decision after poor decision after poor decision and my life is in shambles, my life is, is in need of repair, my life is in need of restoration. Well, let me give you hope. Jesus is in the restoration business. Jesus restores lives. Jesus brings new life into what is old and maybe is walking dead. He can bring life into you again. So as we walk through this today, I want you to understand the power and the magnitude of the cross and the humility that Jesus walked with to get to the point of laying his life down for you and I. I want you to understand the beauty of the cross today. I want you to understand the beauty of the cross. And the reality is we can't know the beauty of the cross until we understand how horrific and how ugly and how heinous of a death the cross was. I want us to gain a greater understanding today of the beauty. Paul writes that Christ humbled himself even to the point of death on the cross. But the humility part starts with his transformation, going from deity and taking on the form of man, taking on humanity as, as a form, which, which brings limitations, right? Which is restricting, which is a lesser form. It says he, he became nothing, so to speak, right? He takes on this humility of becoming a man, and that was the first step. And that would be like you and I maybe taking on the form of a dog and saying, okay, I'm going to give up some of the freedoms that I have. I'm going to take on the limitations of being a dog. I'm going to take on these restrictions and all for the sake of other dogs, right? And this is essentially the equivalent parallel that we're seeing that Jesus said, I'm going to take on the equivalent in, in the physical nature of humanity all for the sake of humanity. So he humbles himself in that way to begin with. But, but understand that, that for him to die on the cross required even greater humility than taking on human nature. For a whole lot of reasons. And let's, let's start with some facts. Crucifixion, first of all, was not practiced on Roman citizens. In fact, the Romans considered it so painful, so gruesome, and so shameful that they would not practice it on Roman citizens. They thought this kind of pain and torture was beneath them. They thought this was undignifying for the Roman people to see their own people killed in this way. And so the very act of crucifixion was considered so shameful that it was considered beneath the Romans. It was only used for capital punishment on people from outside of Rome. Now, were there Romans who were killed? Yes, but, but the majority of those who were crucified were not Romans. In fact, they would be others who, who would be considered less than Romans. So Jesus being on the cross would have been shameful. Part of the thought process behind the cross was to subject the criminal to as much indignity as humanly possible. So they would hang naked on the cross while they were clinging to life. And, and while they were dying, they're there fully exposed with, with full shame. Because the hope was that the people would see and say, this man, this name, this family line is a disgrace. They are shameful in the eyes of the people. 
We want, to, we want the world to see them completely without any dignity or any shred of self-respect left in them as they die. They wanted them to die without any pride left. So it takes humility to be willing to subject yourself to death on the cross. And then it was a slow and painful death. They wanted it to be agony. They wanted it to be uh, hurt, hurting the whole time. They didn't want there to be ever a reprieve for a moment from the pain of their death. They would mostly die by asphyxiation where they, they would suffocate to death. And so for them to muster the energy to pull themselves up to take a breath was, was almost more harmful than it was good. It was almost more uh, de debilitating than it was helpful for them to take the breath because of the energy they were exerting could have been the last bit they had. So taking on the cross and, and, and submitting yourself to that and humbling yourself to the point of the cross shows a great deal of one love and respect for us, but it shows an even greater deal of humility from Jesus, our Savior. So when Paul says that Jesus humbled himself to death on a cross, he means that he humbled himself to take on the most heinous form of death the world has ever known, both in pain and in shame, and that there was no differentiating between that and another option. This was the worst way possible. It was an ugly scene. So today I want us to gain a full understanding of the mindset of Paul as we talk through this understanding of Jesus' humility that he takes on, that he took for us to die on the cross, to subject himself to death on a cross. And there's three things I want to talk about. And the first is this, the contradiction. The Roman world would, 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 would crucify people left and right. They would crucify sinners, for sure, and criminals. But the idea within the Jewish mindset that, that the Messiah would be crucified to them was contradictory. Now, when I was a kid, I loved oxymorons. I thought oxymorons were like the funniest thing that ever existed. I just found them to be so funny. And so things like jumbo shrimp, right? Like this really big, small thing. It doesn't make any sense, but we, you know, it's these words that we use, the human language or the English language does some funny things. It's a, this understanding of oxymoron, right? And so, so it's just kind of this backwards thought. So we have jumbo shrimp, uh, negative income. Have you ever lived your life with a little bit of negative income, right? And it's one of those things you go, how is it income, but it's reducing you it's negative income. One that we use uh, at, at every light church picnic kind of things, plastic silverware. Plastic silverware, right? You know, some people now are writing plastic cutlery because it's more refined and it doesn't sound as ridiculous for sure, right? So plastic silverware, bittersweet, which we've experienced bittersweet moments in our lives where we're thankful for where we are, what we're doing, but we're, we're sad for what we've left or, or moved on from, right? So bittersweet. And then old news, doesn't make sense because news implies that it is new, that it is something new to be heard, something new to that being revealed. So to have old news uh, would just be like, it, it doesn't make sense, but we use it, right? And so you go, oh, that's old news. Well, it's not news. It's just, that's an old fact, right? So oxymoron. So in the Jewish world, crucified Messiah would be more than just an oxymoron, this idea of, of a backwards kind of thought process. In fact, it would go beyond that. It was complete contradiction of statements to them. See, understanding the great offense that was the cross helps us to understand exactly why Paul struggled to accept Jesus as the Messiah in the first place. We see in the books of Acts that he was persecuting the church, uh, but not just saying harsh things or, or trying to tax them more or put pressure on them at a hev heavier level, but no, he was uh, trying to make life miserable. He was trying to eradicate the church. And Acts 3 tells us that Paul was ravaging the church in the New English Standard Version. And that's a strong word. It was especially strong during that time. Uh, and the word refers to like a wild beast ripping flesh from bone. His, his, his goal was to destroy the church. He didn't want there to be a shred of, 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 of an ounce of any kind of inkling of the church of Jesus. He wanted it removed, but he wanted to do it in a harsh way. In fact, uh, we see that, that Paul is, as Saul, standing in approval as Stephen is stoned to death. In Acts 9-1, Paul is breathing out murderous threats saying, if you continue in this, we will kill you. I, you go, this, 
It doesn't make sense to say that, that you are this religious leader and you're going, I'm going to kill anybody, anybody who disagrees with the fact that Jesus is not the Messiah. Right? So he is not just persecuting, he is trying to destroy, he is trying to kill, he is trying to strike fear in the hearts of the men and women that of that time that were believing as Jesus as the Messiah. Because Jesus had been crucified, therefore in his mind, in his world, he cannot be the Messiah because the crucifixion is not dignified. To the Messiah. In Galatians, Paul tells us at this point, after conversion, he says, listen, I tried to destroy the church. His goal was to destroy the church. Why was, was this? What was his reasoning? Because, see, the church claimed that Jesus was the Messiah. That was not the issue. The fact that, that it was the Messiah was being preached as somebody who had been crucified and resurrected. The principal stumbling block for Paul was that they preached that the Messiah had been crucified. That was the main issue here. It's a contradiction of thoughts. In his mind, there was no way that a Messiah would be subjected to such a heinous act. There was no way that the Messiah would ever be hanging, dead, naked, exposed in front of all of the people to see. Because that's not dignifying for God to do. So that's not a dignified act for God to do. So there's a struggle there for Paul to grasp and understand and say, no, he can't be the Messiah. He's supposed to, the Messiah is supposed to be strong and powerful. He was to produce images of splendor and triumph, but, but to have him hanging naked on a cross, beaten and mocked, that just didn't work. What Paul didn't know at the time as he was still saw was that while hanging on the cross, he was preparing for the moment that he would be strong and powerful. He was waiting for the moment to reveal his splendor. He was setting the ultimate moment of triumph. It wasn't a reduction of who he was. It was him simply humbling himself for you and I, knowing that this was the only way. The cross was the most humiliating act on the planet, right? Jesus endured humiliation for our justification. He endured humiliation for our justification. He knew that it was worth it in the end. Romans 4.25 says, He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. First part of the process was that he had to give himself up and it had to be on a cross. He had to lay down his life, humbling himself to death, even to death on the cross. So the first thing was the contradiction. The second thing, the curse. Here's another issue that uh, the Jews had with the Messiah being crucified. Crucifixion was a curse. In fact, uh, we find that in Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy 21, 22, and 23, it says, And if a man has committed a crime punishable by death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him the same day for a hanged man is cursed by God. You understand that? He's cursed by God. So in the mind of the Jewish world, in the mind of the Jews, Jesus could not be the Messiah because he was cursed. He just couldn't be because he was cursed because not only was it awful and shameful, it's now it's a curse from God. So Jesus has to fully humble himself to, to a moment, to a place of taking on the curse of the cross. See, if we're going to understand the beauty, we have to understand the full ugly of it. We have to understand what does humility look like? What does is, what is this humbled state of Jesus truly look like? And the fact of the matter is, it says in Deuteronomy that if he's a hanged man, he's hanging there dead, hanging on a tree, hanging on this cross, that he is cursed. You could have a Messiah, right, in the Jewish world, and you could have somebody be crucified, but they could not be one and the same. You couldn't have both. Paul, or Saul, rather, would hear these words not just simply as contradiction, but the idea that the Messiah would be openly cursed by God would be blasphemy. So understand the struggle that he had to deal with to recognize Jesus as Savior. 
But here's what's beautiful about it in Acts in the early church. And we'll read in Acts 4, 9 through 12. Uh, and this is in the ESV today. And it says this, If we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, right? They're, they're shining a light on the moment. Whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him, this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. See, they're shining a light on the fact that he was crucified. They don't see that as a blemish or as a mark to say he can't be the Messiah because he's walking with the curse of crucifixion. They're saying, no, it is by the crucifixion that then God raises him from the dead that he is able to then save you and I. They're appealing to him. They're saying, listen, don't, don't be hung up on the fact that you can't reconcile in your minds that Jesus would be taken to a cross to bear the curse. This isn't a hang up for us. This is a beautiful thing. The church doesn't shy away from this. Yes, there was a curse. In fact, it was the curse of our sin, of your sin and my sin. That's the beauty of this, is that Jesus takes on our sin and he carries it to the cross in order to accomplish a great work for our lives. So while they struggled with this idea that Jesus was cursed, I praise God that he took it all on him so that I might have forgiveness. To add to the humility and shame, Jesus took our sin, taking the curse of sin with him. Jesus was cursed, but he was cursed for you and I. Because he knew the only way to rid the world of the curse was for him to take it upon himself. So we talked about the contradiction, and we talked about the curse. Let's talk about the offense of the cross. The cross was beyond offensive to the Jewish leaders, right? That's why... Paul was so adamant in making this statement, even death on a cross. It wasn't just that he was willing to die, but that he was willing to do it in such a way that he was willing to go in such an offensive thought process and say, you know what, I will die on a cross for the people of this world. The cross was gruesome. The cross was painful. It was humiliating and it was shameful. To even begin to think that God would allow himself to be on the cross and put through the, the hands of the people is just plain offensive to some. Yet it was the only way. It was our sin that put him there. It was our sin that kept him there. But it was his blood that covers our sin. You see, the beauty of the cross is only fully understood after we fully understand just how awful it truly was. We have to understand just how disgraceful it was. It wasn't just gruesome, it was shameful as well. Yet in the midst of that, there is beauty. Because you see, only Jesus can take something so ugly and make it beautiful. Only Jesus can take something so awful and make it wonderful. Only Jesus. And the beauty in all of this is that he can do the same thing in your life. He can do the same thing for you. He gives beauty for ashes. He takes your rags and gives you righteousness. He takes your brokenness and turns it into blessing. He turns shame into honor. You see, he's a God of restoration. He's been doing it since creation of man, right? Since the fall, he has started this restoration process. And now you and I today can step into his restoration, his grace. And he didn't stop doing it. He still does it today. Jesus didn't just go to the cross for the guilt of our sin. He went to the cross for the shame of our sin as well. Today, Jesus doesn't just have the ability to turn your life around. He has the desire to do so. He wants nothing more than for you to give your everything to him. 
He wants you to ask him into your heart today. And I know we haven't spent a long time this morning discussing this. I want you to hear my heart. I want you to hear the depths of my love for you and the depths of my love for your eternity and then belonging to see your soul sing. This morning, right where you are, wherever you're listening from, wherever you're watching from, if you're saying right now, you know what, I, I need to get right with Jesus. I know that right now that this has a lot of people questioning and thinking through their eternity and what is life beyond this because there are so many people that are being affected by this disease and we don't want to act like it's nothing but i want to take a moment to tell you that there is hope for your future that there is salvation and that your sins can be forgiven that if you just stop for a moment and you just say you know what jesus i need you in my life i need you in my life and if you just recognize today that you say, you know what, I need Jesus, I want to stop and I want to give you a moment to receive him into your heart and to ask him in your life. And it's really simple. The Bible says that if we confess with our mouth and then believe in our heart, right? We confess that, that Jesus died, that he rose again, that he died for my sins and we believe in our heart. Guess what? You will be saved. So here's what I want you to do. If you're with us today and you're watching this, you know what, I need to ask Jesus in my heart. I want you to repeat this simple prayer. Say, dear Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Come into my life and be the Lord of my life forever. Jesus, I confess that you are my Savior. Lead me, guide me, direct me all the days of my life. Amen. Amen. And listen, if you just said that prayer with us, if you would do us a favor, would you direct message us? We want to connect with you to help you because we don't want to just leave you out to dry. We want to help you grow and to walk and be surrounded by a community of believers that want to build you up and encourage you on this journey. Thank you for doing so. I want to say thank you for joining in today and watching with us. I pray blessing over your home and your family. And I ask that God will begin to keep you safe and that he will keep his protection upon you as we walk through all of this together. Looking forward to being together again. God bless you. The best is yet to come.